on the way? No? Okay, we will just start now. So, um, friends and colleagues, good afternoon and thank you for making time to be here today. So, as the convener of intersections of the literary and artistic worlds in Myanmar and the region in the 20th century and the initiator of the open access online database of Ong So's illustrations, which is this gathering's point of departure as well as source of funding through the NTU startup grant for new faculty members. Allow me to begin by situating the symposium and the database against the context of art history studies from this part of the world first. So we will mix here from three speakers, Sen Yu Jin, Lin Cheng Ju, and Hassan Mutalib, followed by a discussion during which refreshments will be distributed by our graduate student assistants. We have Rit Sao and Ya Ting, and then for video recording, we have Vincent and Adrian at the back. Thank you. Um, and then after that, we will hear Kim Yazin and Roger Nelson before a second discussion. Our work on Baji Onso began in April 2015, and this modest symposium was scheduled to mark its official launch. On this occasion, it is apt to address two questions. First, what might this open access online database of illustrations offer to art history, the discipline in which this project is anchored? Second, what might be the pertinence of examining art historically equivocal territories like illustration, cartoon, comics, animation, poetry, and novels in relation to making sense of the constructs of art in Myanmar and the region, a loosely defined geographical expanse intended to subsume South Asia and Southeast Asia. In the next 15 minutes or so, I will be using the word art in inverted commas as a term whose usage backs circumspection and scrutiny. Now, due to the absence of data works by Ong So, his illustrations in print offer the only historically verifiable means of tracing his artistic evolution between 1948 and 1990. To begin with, too few early works have survived for us to even know what Myanmar's trailblazer of modern art did prior to 1980. This colossal body of works currently numbering around 6,000, only two thirds of which have, which have been made accessible on the database, tells the story of not only one artist's fervor, but also that of the emergence of a novel artistic consciousness. To locate these materials' significance in the histories of art of Myanmar and Southeast Asia, and to constrict it to these national and regional borders is, however, as customary as it is short-sighted. The exceptionality which lies in the assimilation and amalgamation of a diversity of techniques of mental cultivation, cognitive processes, and pictorial idioms from across space and time is not exclusive to any nation or political region. Indeed, the impetus to expand human consciousness through the rejuvenation of the inherited and the familiar by way of selective synthesis with foreign worldviews and technologies brought on by the types of change is the hallmark of any robust culture and enlightened mind. Confronted with the wealth and potential of illustrations accumulated since the year 2000, it was the reality of the brevity of human life and the awareness of my material and intellectual limitations that led me to explore the internet as a suitable repository as well as a platform for their dissemination. Clearly, a catalogue raisonné of Onsou's illustrations in the thousands is financially unthinkable, not to mention that any monograph can take years to see the light of day. A website to stage virtual exhibitions of Onsou's works, bajiangsou.com, was hence created and launched in 2009 with the technical assistance of an ex-student, Chris Lee Kian a Facebook page which allowed me to reach a wider, though not necessarily more discerning audience, followed in 2011. Now, what the website and Facebook page lacked was an intelligent organization analysis and visualization of uploaded data for the efficient for efficient browsing and study. With also illustrations.org under the direction of Hedron Sum, who's here with us, supported by the head of ADM Library, Phoebe Lim. My initial understanding of the database metamorphosed from an inert repository to what we call a generous interface, driven by the aspiration to enhance the discoverability of data. Now, what do I mean by a generous interface, a term coined by Mitchell Whitelaw? Hedron can definitely explain it more accurately and thoroughly than myself, but I shall nonetheless attempt to do so in layman's terms. 
A da database that merely serves the whole data is akin to a storage space whereby the organization and retrieval of stored items is not necessarily efficient. Its location in relation to other items is also problematic. Now, for example, should an art <coughs> Google vase for holding flowers be classified as an objet d'art and arranged on the top shelf or a regular vase to be stored in another corner with other IKEA items serving the same function? Amongst the many things Hedron has done to make the database a generous interface is to render visible the mass of data as well as their relationships by designing ontologies. At the most basic level, the illustrations can be assessed through a search based on the <coughs> of publication, the title of publication, source of image, type of image, decade, and dominant color. What follows is the possibility of retrieving illustrations using up to three keywords identifying the motifs, themes, and techniques in each illustration. In this way, it is possible to know in a glance the number of times also featured the female figure, the scarecrow, or scientific formula in his illustrations, <coughs> the period of time when a specific motive or theme was the most regularly represented, or what the associated themes or motifs might be. The findings can next be mapped into visualizations, as Hadron has already done for the date and title of publication, the source and type of image, colors of the printed illustration as well. Now, these visualizations propose metadata with the potential to generate new research, as do the colors of the printed illustration, with respect to printing technology in Myanmar between 1948 and 1990, or the public's altered perception of Onsu's art due to poor printing technology. The same method can be applied to the many uploaded texts by an Onsu with respect to the frequency of keywords like modern painting and art. While these visualizations are not an exact science, the identification of keywords is subjective, for example. They extract data that is otherwise nebulous, unmanageable, or even invisible. And it is this enhanced position, albeit not absolute, that makes this method of a generous interface valuable to art history studies. In making the work of art the site of data mining, this approach to building databases might also moderate the excesses of modish conceptual tools and frameworks, which reflect our inclinations and limitations more than they address the proposed work or works of art. If we are to extend the method to comparative studies across nations, the idea of what the comparison of metadata derived from herbs thus far studied within the nation-centric framework, such as those of the Nanyang artists, for example, is in my opinion exhilarating. What might be the recurrent themes, styles, and techniques? To what extent might they be congruent? What might explain the divergences and commonalities? No doubt the pitfall will be the idolatry of the new in the pursuit of digital humanities as an end in itself. We clearly have not saved ourselves from the same failing censured by Gombrich in his research in the humanities, ideals and idols from 1973. In fact, we might well be at the mercy of bigger and hungrier idols, which we continue to feed in the name of scholarship. Now, before I move on to address the purpose of our gathering today, may I bring to your attention one more but not final property of the online database as a means of practicing art history. It in turn exposes my inconvenience with respect to also illustrations.rg. Capable of mir mirroring the latest findings and pace of ongoing research, its dynamism as a means of documentation and dissemination is unprecedented. By right, based on the current and the current stage of research, one should be able to access at least 60 articles by an other artist and 6,000 illustrations, 2,000 of which are recently scanned illustrations from the National Library of Myanmar and University Central Library of Yangon Universities. The introductory texts under about, which date from the soft launch in December 2016, should also have been replaced with new ones taking into account the latest developments. The keywords should also include all illustrations from the 70s corresponding to the most prolific period of Onso's career. Yet one does not, and that is because I have not been able to keep up with the velocity of this living organic database. Neither have I been able to match the prolificacy of Onso. 
The decision back in 2016 to open the database in spite of ongoing corrections and updates was not involuntary. Interpretation, um, also illustrations.org, will remain work in progress as long as new data continues to emerge. My interpretation of them continues to evolve, and Hadrian continues to come up with groundbreaking ideas to experiment on the possibilities of the online database as a means of generating research and insights. As such, it makes more sense to make available as many materials as possible, never mind the imperfections and oversights awaiting correction, than to bury them. Hope remains that they might kindle someone's curiosity, uh, curiosity, possibly leading to sustained inquiry, lending to the expansion of our art historical imagination and perhaps even human consciousness. So now we come to the symposium. Thank you for bearing with me. With respect to our theme today, intersections of the literary and artistic worlds, it was the many days spent poring over literary periodicals from the second and third quarters of the 20th century that led to the awareness of the crucial role played by illustration in the development, dissemination, and documentation of art in 20th century Myanmar, and ultimately that of the porosity of the fields of activities conventionally studied in isolation, which are illustration, modern art, film, literature and publication in general. Few work confirmed that the artistic and literary worlds in Myanmar were symbiotic. Painters wrote, filmmakers painted, poets inspired painters. The opposition between fine art and commercial art too, often assumed to be universal, is in reality extrinsic, and specialization was not necessarily a sine qua non. Conversations with teachers and colleagues working on India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia only confirm what I observed of Yangon's art worlds. Painters, cartoonists, architects, filmmakers, poets, and novelists rarely worked in isolation of the larger intellectual, political, and artistic currents shaping the epoch. The study of the emergence of art, a foreign construct whose implantation is indissociable from political colonization and cultural imperialism, in isolation of the context of exchange, collaboration, competition, and even rivalry among the creative individuals experimenting on different means of articulating newfound artistic, intellectual, and political consciousnesses, is thus sorely inadequate. In an attempt to uncover the hypothetical unexamined processes and conditions sustaining the spirit of syncretism in art worlds in this part of the world, this symposium was hence convened to, one, investigate the often overlooked medium and agency of illustration in the articulation of art, examine instances of collaboration, dialogue, debate, or and contention between painters, cartoonists, writers, poets, filmmakers, editors, publishers, critics, photographers, etc. Distant genesis of art from the perspective of the literary world reflect on common threads and divergences in the ways in which modern art emerged in tandem with developments in the literary world in Myanmar and the region. <coughs> the interest lies not so much in art per se than how constructs of art might be unpacked, dissolved, or peeled away to reveal the processes of in imaging meaning making and experience conditioned by intention, practical factors and conventions. Indeed, the larger but perhaps overly ambitious aim would be to delineate fresh approaches to thinking about and writing about art beyond that yoked to the Euro-American experience and agenda, which continue to be upheld by institutions of art and higher learning. What might be a more accommodating understanding of art in our part of the world where prior to colonization in the 19th century, there was no equivalent for art as we understand it today? Objects of beauty charged with symbolic meanings that make up daily life, textiles, containers, parasols, etc., would have been the principal preoccupation of image makers, not objects and acts canonized by agents of the art world and enshrined in museums. Further questions include, when does an individual creating cartoons, comics, or animation films come to be perceived as an artist, if ever, and in what spaces? If cultural and mental habits are rarely suppressed overnight, but merely take on new forms, might illustration, comics, photography, and animation, which are better integrated into the quotidian, be in fact avatars of the earlier tr local tradition of so-called art? 
Now, Hassan's observations that animators in Malaysia look to ancient art forms like the Wayang Kulit for inspiration rather than art created by their contemporaries is not insignificant. While nostalgia, or what some art historians refer to as the neo-traditional, might be the case here, there remains the question of how Malaysian animators and their communities and audiences understood art in contrast to the relatively small group of arbiters of art whose bases are the exhibition, art gallery, and museum. Indeed, why did animation and painting in the sense of art not meet in Malaysia as they did in the Philippines with Rock's Lee, for example? Next, might the notion of parallel artworks be a valid point of entry to making sense of the creative impulses and processes as well as their output in this part of the world? These are questions to ponder over. Within the art world, attempts to fix the meaning and representation of art are not new, as we shall hear from Eugene speaking on the United Artists Front of Thailand and New Art Movement in Indonesia. But in the absence of a notion of art venerated as the zenith of made <coughs> images and objects divorced from daily life, what defines the value of an image or object for the lay person? Might the element of social responsibility and activism in cartoons, which we shall hear about in Ching Zhu's works, actually enhance their value in the eyes of their intended audience, making them finer, higher than fine art? In the case of Myanmar, cartoon was highly esteemed as the voice of the people, and many artists subscribing to the modern European construct of art were prolific cartoonists, cartoonists until 1962, when the socialist regime did their best to lead out expressions of dissent. Also, Myanmar's most outstanding artist of the modern period never hid the fact that his first ambition was to be a cartoonist. Indeed, the act of image and meaning making through media like cartoon and illustration was not necessarily perceived as lesser than that via watercolor or oil painting, whose symbolic function as a marker of social status was possibly only relevant to a small circle of elites and social climbers. In addition to image making as a means of articulating and affirming new artistic, political, or intellectual aspirations echoing the transformations in society, our literary pursuits, as we shall next see in Kim Yazin and Rogers Nelson's work, writing and image making partake in osmosis. While the close relationship between writers and artists is not unheard of in the modern Western world, the situation in Myanmar and the region is differentiated by the failure of the Euro-American Euro construct of art to become a living tradition integrated into the lives of former colonial subjects. Political decolonization made no difference. Indeed, it is against this backdrop, untrammeled by a tradition of art perceived as an elevated discipline alienated from the quotidian, that the relative ease with which creative individuals moved from one field to another is better understood in its full contextual significance. The mapping of the contours of art in and on the terms of those to whom it might be meaningful is otherwise futile. The first call for papers for this symposium was made in September 2016. If there are no papers today engaging with photography and film or instances of collaboration, dialogue, debate, or and contention between painters, cartoonists, writers, poets, filmmakers, editors, publishers, critics, photographers, etc., it is because I did not receive any proposals on them. Possible reasons for their lack of representation include the relatively small number of scholars working on them, the failure of the call to interest relevant researchers, and my ineptitude at networking. Regardless, I believe that there are valuable lessons to take away from the work of Cheng Zhu, um, Eugene, Hassan, Kim Yasin, and Roger. Thank you for being here today to share your work with us. Um, from which further questions that lend themselves to pursue the lines of inquiry initiated today might arise. I hope the small group that we are will be conducive to discussions later, and if I still have not been able to whet your interest in how fields of activities usually overlooked by art historians, because they're not exactly art, may enrich the ways in which we can think about, evaluate, and experience art in this part of the world. Um, our speakers will do a better job at that, I'm sure. <laughs> On this note, um, I will invite Eugene to share with us his work on art manifestos produced by art collectives as a site for interdisciplinarity between visual art and other discourses, including literature and popular culture. Thank you.